So this is um, a session, really, I suppose this is filling a gap between our expectations of when Census 2021 would be released and when it's actually going to be released. Um, so the latest information we have is that this is going to be available um, from October. And I'll go through that um, in the session in a bit more detail. Um, please feel free to raise questions as we go along. There's quite a lot of information in here. And if you have particular interest, I'm happy to stop at different points. Um, ideally using the Q&A section um, so that we can pick them out easily. So what I'm going to cover today is um, what we know so far of ONS release plans. Um, I think we expect these to be firmed up with some more dates fairly soon, but there's nothing uh, when I checked yesterday uh, to update what we have. Then to talk about some considerations about using census data. And finally, to um, share with you what we have to offer in terms of events like this and other events um, that are planned to support your use of the census. First of all, there's a phase release over a year. So um, I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. But phase one, we're kind of in at the moment. So on 28th of June, we received the local authority summaries by age and sex. From October to December, we're going to get the topic summaries and area profiles. Um, they cover broadly the same areas, um, but the area profiles are more interactive, whereas the topic summaries are, are intended to be more downloadable, I think, if you, if you want to think about the distinction between them. Phase two will include multivariate data. Um, so that will be a set of tables predefined as in the 2011 release, though there are less tables um, in this release um, currently in the schedule that ONS have published. And alongside that, a flexible table builder, which will be available via ONS. So that will enable you to um, populate tables. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about that later on. And they've also brought forward one of the short term uh, the small population data sets, which is for short term residents. Um, phase three will be uh, a set of other data, so more different population bases, more small populations, and flow data and micro data. Now, this is really based on work with ONS, so it links to England and Wales. Northern Ireland actually released the first data, and they've got another release planned. Um, this week, but there's a slower schedule for the release of their data. And as you probably know, Scotland, the Scotland census only completed uh, a year later. It was extended by a month. Um, and so we don't expect results from that until well into 2023. Um, once all of the results are in from um, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, there will be a UK-wide census, census release, um, but there will be, um, if anybody's interested in that, uh, ask me a question about it later on, and we can talk about uh, what will be included and, and some of the challenges in looking at that data. So the topic summaries are going to be mainly univariate data. Um, they'll be released every two to three weeks from October onwards. So the first block are on demography and migration. Um, they include variables like the age and sex breakdowns, but at different geographical scales. So down to output area level, administrative scales, et cetera. And I'll talk a bit more about the geography in a minute. They will also include um, country of birth, age of arrival, and year of arrival in the UK. So we'll cover migration topics as well. Um, the second group, We'll cover ethnic group, national identity, language and religion. The third, um, the veterans information, which has been brought forward. Uh, the fourth on health, disability and unpaid care. Um, the fifth on housing, which includes um, information at household level about tenure, about um, overcrowding, etc. Then labour market and travel to work. Um, the, the next area, these are voluntary questions. So though they're new to census 2021, 
um, new to the census altogether, uh, we're not clear on the return rates at the moment, but they cover sexual orientation and gender identity. And then finally, education. So this data is available um, for, there will be variables for individuals, variables for households, and also um, in terms of housing variables for dwelling spaces. So it will show something, some estimate of empty dwellings. Uh, so Suzanne's asked about returns. Initially in Scotland, the return rate was quite low. I think they've largely um, increased that by the extension of the month. So there will be some issues, I think, uh, particularly in Glasgow, that they expect. But I think they're reasonably confident they can make population estimates based on the returns that they've received. Um, I think we're waiting for more information from Scotland about how that process is going now. So um, they have actually changed the way that they're using administrative data to check the returns. Right, so in terms of geographical data, this is now available from the Open ONS Open Geography Portal and will be available from the UK Data Service. It has been scheduled to be loaded up. Um, we still have some work to do on our website to make 2021 um, census data visible, and that will be done by the time the data is released, um, the full sets of, of univariate and bivariate data, multivariate data. Um, so the boundary data that's there is um, administrative data on local authority health districts, electoral data on areas like constituency and wards, I'll come to you in a minute, Robert, um, and statistical areas built up from output areas, which I'll say a bit more about afterwards. So Robert's asked that we won't be able to tabulate health data against ethnicity. That's included in the multivariate um, data release. So um, the my understanding is that for ethnicity, for example, what you will be able to see is ethnicity by age and sex but not by any of the other variables until the multivariate data is released. Um, I'm pretty certain that's one of the tables that is there, but if not, it should be available through the flexible table builder. Okay, so that's the geography. Um, just to say a little bit more about output areas. So output areas were introduced in 2001. The idea was of them was to give a more stable geography than the kind of ward data had done previously. So significant reorganizations forced by changing populations meant that war boundaries have not really been consistent um, in many areas over time. So in 2001, um, output areas were built and they had a kind of set size with a minimum and maximum and a target size. Um, they were based on an analysis of matching characteristics within the population um, so that the areas were more homogenous and subsequent revisions have tried to minimize changes. So my understanding is that the, uh, well, the number of changes in from 2001 to 2011 was less than 5%. And similarly, that target has been met for the 2021 census. Okay, Cedric, yeah. Um, so the univariate data, phase one data, will be available down to output area level with one caveat about statistical disclosure, which I'll talk about um, later on. So those output area geographies are then built up into two, um, a, what's called a lower level or LSOA, um, again with target sizes, and they are linked to quite a lot of data that's published. So. For example, the index of multiple deprivation and the different indicators, administrative data, um, and recorded crime data. Um, and the next level up is mid-level super output areas, um, probably akin to the size of wards. Um, again, there are statistics published at this level, so GCSE attainment, educational attainment, COVID cases. And all of those output area geography boundaries are constrained within local authorities, so we don't get overlapping areas between local authorities. So they're, they're usable in that sense. Okay, so um, area profiles are similar. And there's some examples in here of the types of things that are there. So in the first release on demography and migration, as I said before, there's sex and age, 
There's also legal partnership status, whether people are living in um, private housing or communal establishments, um, their country of birth, how long they've lived in the UK, and things about household composition. I think I've covered most of the others. In terms of work, there's economic activity, hours worked in banded areas, industry and occupation, and also um, kind of information about travel to work. Um, again, there's a caveat on that, given that the census was taken um, mid-pandemic, there probably wasn't a lot of travel to work for many occupations. So um, what we have is limited to some extent. Um, in terms of education, we've got whether people are in full-time education or highest qualification. And on health, there's a self-rate reported um, subjective health measure and also long-term health problem or disability and whether you, the person provided unpaid care. So that's phase one. Um, as I said, if you've got any questions, then feel free to put them into the chat and I will, into the Q&A and I'll pick them up as we go along. Um, so in phase two, we're going to get information about the short term population. This is people who said they intended to stay in the UK less than 12 months. There will also be defined sets of tables and we will share um, this version of the slides, but there are previous ones that give you that link to the details of those defined sets of tables um, and they will be available at different geographical scales. In terms of the flexible table builder, all we've seen is a mock-up, but it's worth kind of diverting a little bit to explain what will happen. So um, in 2001, we saw this strange um, changing of numbers. So we didn't have one and two counts. We had zero or three, and that could mean any of those numbers at different um, geographical scales. Um, in 2011, uh, the challenges with that not summing to the total were recognized and what happened is that small counts were swapped between different areas so small counts may not reflect the actual area they were in um, this time that process will happen again but once the table has been defined there will be a rule-based statistical disclosure control that will suppress and tell you how much has been suppressed of the information you've requested. And I think the, the last thing to say about that is the variable categories will vary between univariate and multivariate tables based on that. Now, at the moment, my understanding is that for um, some variables, and I'll use ethnicity as an example, a reduced set of categories will be available in the flexible table builder and in a lot of the multivariate table. So previously what happened with this data was that the balance between scale and the number of categories was determined by um, ONS and the pre-published tables were therefore limited in scope in particular ways. Um, at the moment, it looks like the scope on variables like ethnicity will be cut back um, in, in the multivariate tables. I know there's been quite a bit of lobbying of um, ONS to get them to um, change this. So it's a bit of space we'll have to wait and see. But overall, I think the message is that you need to balance the geographical scale you're looking at against the level of detail you want in your categories. OK, so a question from Samuel about the multivariate tables. Um, they will be down to output area level subject to statistical disclosure control. So depending on what you're looking at, um, if the counts are reasonable, um, they will be there. And there will be population and household estimates, I think is the um, thing to say. Um, so in the, the data published in, um, in June, what we saw were the actual counts of data collected and also the population estimates derived from those alongside mid-year population estimates. I don't think we'll get that level of detail at down to output area level, um, but there will be estimates of population and household at that level. Marion, uh, the po population estimates are, are 
the population estimates. That's what we will get, and that will be the base of all statistics released from the census. For those from local authorities, there's a strong commitment from ONS to look very carefully at mid-year population estimates for 2022. Um, so though these won't have characteristics, they will be used to inform resource allocation because um, as you're probably aware, there's significant concerns about um, population change during the period of the pandemic. Um, and some authorities are very concerned about um, losing resources as a result. Okay, so, um, and then phase three, I'm gonna go through each of these in turn. Um, so these five areas, um, I haven't got much on detailed migration data. The promise is that will be a, a number of tables developed around migration. Um, and that's included there, but at the moment it's only words. There's no real, um, real detail. So migration data broken down by a number of different characteristics. So the alternative population bases um, cover workplace population, um, workday population, which is a combination of those people who work in a particular geographical area and those who aren't working and who live there. Um, an out of term population. So this affects students. Um, so students were asked to complete their return as if they were at their term time address, even if they were staying at home. And quite a lot of checking has been done to, to make sure to allocate students to the correct address. So the population should reflect students at their institutions and the address they would have been living at um, if the pandemic hadn't happened. Um, and it's the basis for kind of further analysis about issues with students. Um, the second address is where people have identified um, that they live, have a second address, which they stay at more than 30 days in the year. So things like holiday homes, but also um, work-based addresses for people who have a residential and workplace living arrangement. In terms of small populations, we have a number of writing categories, and there's a, there's a kind of promise, depending on statistical disclosure control, to include a breakdown by five-year age bands by sex for selected ethnic groups and countries of birth. Um, so the categories that are eligible for this are ethnic group. So I would sound a note of caution with ethnic group in that not everybody would have completed this. Uh, for those who completed a tick box answer, um, there's no requirement to fill in ethnic group um, in England and Wales. In Scotland, interestingly, there were different ways of asking this question. All of them had another box, write in box. But for example, the prompt for Black African identified um, the country that people came from, the, the um, prompt for Black Caribbean prompted a, a question about identity. So um, they will be there. They were um, very rich data down to output area level in 2011 and 2001. Whether the statistical disclosure control will reduce the availability of that information is not clear at the moment. Um, similarly, with country of birth, there's um, a lot of detail on country of birth. And in the raw variables, there's quite a lot of information. So we may well get a good look at that in phase one. Um, religion has a write-in and national identity has a write-in. Um, there are a number of groups that, based on people's requests, there will be data sets on at MSOA level. So that includes Cornish, Jain, Kashmiri, Nepalese, Ravadasia, and Sikh. And there was a question about British Sign Language, and there will also be consideration about writing um, data and how robust it is on other groups. So they've identified Romanian, Somalian, and Turkish Cypriot. So flow data is probably different, but it is based on the origin, origin of the flow and the destination of the flow. Um, so it will cover issues on migration. So internal migration within England and Wales, um, to start with, that will be harmonized with Northern Ireland and Scotland once that data is available. Um, 
workplace flow, so the commuting um, information that's previously used for calculating travel to work areas, et cetera. Um, second address flow, so for those people who have a second address, um, where it is and, and their flows, um, and student flow. So this is will be based on the term time and out of term address. Finally, in this section, the micro data samples. So these are um, data sets that hold multiple variables for individuals. And there'll be a 5% sample, uh, regional and combined local authority geography. So the combined local authorities are a relatively smallish number. So they are the smaller, dis smallish, smaller districts, the city of London, the Isles of Scilly, um, as examples. There'll also be, um, for the first time in quite a while, a 1% sample of households. And there'll be a further 1% sample that's sent into an international database. So those are all safeguarded. I should have said the flow data and micro data are likely to be only available from the UK data service. On the flow data, there will be open data, safeguarded data and secure data. So we hold data at three levels. Open data, you don't need to be registered with us. You can just pick it up and use it. Examples include things like teaching data sets, but there isn't a lot of information in them. They tend to be quite limited relatively. Um, safeguarded data, you need to be registered with us and generally you can access safeguarded data, though some do have requirements to notify the data owner of the purpose you're going to use that data for. And then secure data um, is the most detailed and you need to go through an accreditation process to become um, authenticated to use that data and then to use it in secure settings, which essentially means you um, can interact with the data, but you can't take things out without them being approved. So it's quite resource intensive. Both ONS and UK Data Service operate um, secure data training accreditation and also um, provide facilities for researchers to access that data. Um, and in the secure data, there'll be a 10% sample of individuals and a 10% sample of households. So it's worth saying as an, as an insurance policy, um, for some of us, this might be a useful way of getting at more detailed um, multivariate data. Though the geography is more limited, we won't be able to go down to local neighborhoods within it. At least in the um, in the safeguarded data. So that's the kind of summary of what to expect from ONS and when. Um, what I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about is the considerations you need to um, take into account. So first of all, the obvious one, the pandemic was carried out during, uh, sorry, the, the census was carried out during a pandemic. So there will be impacts on employment things like employment, where people live, um, what work they were doing, and education. And basically, ONS are going to report fairly soon on an overall, if they haven't done already, um, and they will be looking at this in more detail. And they will provide supporting information um, alongside the releases of data, saying how it might have affected particular variables. I Marion, sorry, I don't know the answer to this. I think there are some challenges with the rural urban indicator, but there is a there is a kind of classification there. Um, I suppose one of I I I can't answer that question. I'm, I'm sure it's there on the ONS website. And um, if you want to log a call with our help desk, which I'll give you details about later on, then somebody will pick it up and have a look at it. Um, I can't do that interactively at the moment. This time, there was a new quality assurance process, which meant that the figures that were um, from the counts and the estimates that were being made were shared with local authorities who wanted to. I think around 270 in England and Wales did so. Um, that's one of the reasons for the delay, because that process obviously took quite a long time. But what ONS asked for was evidence that would challenge the counts and estimates 
that had been collected from those local authorities. Um, and there's already a kind of some information in draft and there will be publications from ONS on that process and how that worked. Um, so I went to a conference recently where ONS were, were talking about these and there's a number of people working on publications to support our analysis in the future. So I think an important thing for us to think about is the coverage. So if we look at the coverage overall, the headline figure is very promising, 97%. But that varies significantly between areas. And I suppose the areas we would expect to have lower rates of coverage it may be the areas some of us are more interested in. So the way that um, those counts have been turned into estimates might be important depending on the type of analysis you're doing. So you would need to think about and read the publications that come out around that process. Um, again, these are being worked on and will be released as we go along. But this kind of background tactical information um, is quite useful because we are dealing with population and household estimates. Then there is the changes in geography. So if you're interested in change over time, you may need to think about um, how the geography in the areas you're looking at has changed specifically. Um, I did work on comparison between 2001 and 2011 census, um, looking at Greater Manchester at neighbourhood level. Um, and there were significant changes caused by housing market changes. So the development of city centre and town centre living was quite significant. It's likely to be significant again in, in quite a lot of places. And also the clearance of um, from housing. Um, the the changing nature of of housing provision. Um, this might be more um, challenging to get at because I think for for me in two thousand and one two thousand eleven what I saw were major um, redevelopments taking place. Um, it feels like in the last ten years we've had a lot more infill change. So whether that will impact boundaries or whether the boundaries will stay the same is quite interesting, but places will will inevitably grow in parts of, of the conurbation I might look at. Um, so this is a question from Maria on English, date, English language data. So this is included within the second release, Ethnicity, Language, National Identity and Religion, um, and has components um, around English language competence. Um, for Welsh, it also has um, things about Welsh language co competence. For Scotland, it has Gaelic Scots. And for Northern Ireland, it has both Ulster Scots and Irish questions. So depending on which country you're looking at, they will all include something about English language. And it is the second release in the England and Wales census data. So it should be available this autumn. So the last point to make here um, is around trust and willingness to disclose some characteristics. So um, we are in a strange time. Um, there is lots of lack of trust and particular groups may particularly distrust aspects of the questioning. So. Um, for some other work I was doing, I was just reading on a report by government published this year on gypsies and travellers uh, using 2011 census data. So they go on the baseline of the population then, which according to the census was 55,000 around. Um, in fact, what was um, the actual population based on a number of other sources like accommodation needs assessment was estimated to be 300,000. So a number of people from that community didn't feel willing to disclose that aspect of their identity. Um, with voluntary questions, we really don't know. So on religion, on sexual identity and gender identity, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. We don't know whether people will disclose things and we don't know what people might feel sensitive about. So um, we've always held to not asking about citizenship in the census, but there may well be some lack of trust from those 
going through um, asylum processes or who have been through them um, to disclose those characteristics. Sharon, I'm not sure if there are sensitivity, sensitivity issues about military veteran status. You know, I don't know how people feel. So I think for those researching in that area, it's something they would need to consider, but it's not an area I'm familiar with. I'm more familiar with issues around race migration and, and that kind of set of data. Okay, so that's the kind of issues to consider. So the last part of the presentation is really thinking about what we have to offer. Um, we're clearly not the only provider of training. Uh, it's worth noting, though many of you probably already know this, that we are funded by the ESRC. So the training we provide is free um, and the materials we provide on the website, et cetera, are free to use. Um, and we will be a key partner in, we are a key partner in the delivery of census data um, and the repository for, for the more advanced products like flow data and micro data. So we know that some of these may be also be provided by ONS and NOMIS. So these are likely to be available from other sources, aggregate data. Um, so to be able to select data, most of you will be familiar with NOMIS or the UK data service. Our interface is being uh, refined, so it will probably look more like um, the NOMIS type interface and in that you will be able to select the variable and see what's available um, in, a, in a more friendly window interface than, than Infuse, though Infuse work fine. Um, geographical data will be available from us and from the ONS geography portal. And then, as I said before, flow data and microdata are likely only available from us. In terms of thinking about what we do, I think we think about different audiences and, and are developing ideas about how we can promote um, access by a range of audiences. So our, our core is probably the academic research and teaching um, establishment. And many of you will come from that background. We are also working with um, students in HE, but trying to extend our reach out into schools, FE and schools, and we will be providing census um, information and guidance for um, aimed at school students. Um, in terms of the public sector, we have use by national departments, local health and councils, and we are thinking about gearing some products. Okay, Samuel, Samuel yeah. I think we'll promote the, um, the data service interface fairly soon. The, the web designs changes are in, and they will be pointing you to different places on the UK data service where the data is held. At the moment, they reflect kind of a lot of information that is not about just getting at the data that you want to use. Um, so that redesign of the website is imminent um, and, and will provide access. So I'm not sure it's gonna be that link you say specifically, but there will be front page access to census data. There'll be information where you find the census data that will reflect the priority that a lot of people will be placing on 2021 data. So I said there's public sector interest and voluntary and community sector interest. And um, we have been talking to uh, key stakeholders in those sectors and thinking about how we can better reach them with the materials we have, given that they're free to access, though obviously they have a cost um, to using them in terms of the organizational capacity needed. So the kind of things we're doing, um, things like this, so just telling people about it. Um, I've done, I've had a series of presentations at conferences in the latest round, um, including one run by the Ronnie Mead Trust, which was quite interesting uh, on race and migration. So connecting with a non-traditional audience for us. We'll be running a series of how-to se sessions linked to the release of the data. So there is a geography session coming up. There's an aggregate data um, session plan. So um, data in spotlight census targeted at the end of October at the moment. 
as flow data and microdata are released next year, we'll also be looking at those. And alongside that, we're interested in thinking about techniques and substantive areas of interest. So thinking about the kind of things that people might want to ask questions about and starting from a problem rather than starting from an interface and access to data. Um, we also plan some sessions next year jointly with ONS in some cases where we're going to look at statistical disclosure control, um, the coverage and imputation and the implications of COVID-19. So those are scheduled, well, they're not, we haven't got dates yet, but we plan to hold those in spring, um, sorry, from um, early 2023 onwards, and, and the modifiable area, aerial unit problem, which uh, for those of you who aren't aware, is the impact of drawing boundaries around particular places and what happens on the edges of those boundaries. Um, an interesting example in London is that the change to wards means that the data is based from ONS on um, a particular way of estimating. Um, the GLA have refined that method uh, to, to use a housing weighting based approach to allocating their ward counts. And in terms of training and materials, we have um, one more workshop um, on planning and research design schedule for next week, um, which is aiming at picking up people who have a clear research idea and want to take part in um, a kind of focused activity, thinking about how they might plan that. We have um, a session in November on using census data for teaching. And we've been working on developing Excel tools um, to demonstrate how you can analyze census data and also provide information on how you can create your own um, analysis using Excel. So I think for us, the branch into Excel is a new one um, relatively, but is as it's so widely used, particularly outside of the academy, it feels like a, a space we need to fill um, because that's the way many, many people will be accessing that data. We will also be producing documents um, that will update the release schedule as we get information, um, doing short video materials to support the training. And we're working on a set of explainers for key census variables. So <clears throat> picking up the new variables and those that are quite complex um, to explain what's there to give details of the categories available, how they're available, um, how they're planned to be um, included in multivariate analysis, analysis, and in some substantive areas, some of the cautions about using them um, for particular purposes. And finally, we have a, a help desk, which you can email um, any query to, and they are picked up by people like me who will address um, questions you raise. The help desk is, has broader functions. So if you have issues about accessing um, the UK data service, et cetera, there are other parts of the service that will pick that up. Um, but our team pick up the substantive queries, uh, will pick up the substantive queries on census issues.